his dog came over maybe several moments later and started barking in my dog's face and my, literally he just sat there like it was like crazy or whatever like something happened and he came over grabbed his dog when he was barking in his face and walked away he came back stated to me your dog nipped my dog this is the plaintiff felix calderon he says the defendant's dog attacked his dog nico at a dog park and he was very apologetic about the whole thing that night when he told him about the vet bills, he said he'd meet him the next day with the money he was owed. Sure enough, the shady guy didn't show up. And now he's not answering the phone and is trying to ignore him. And he won't stand for it. He's suing for $387.95, the amount he's owed. This is the defendant, Lyndon Houghton. He says there was a multi-dog scuffle at the dog park, and the plaintiff did mention to him that his dog's ear got nipped. There was never any mention, however, that his dog was the one doing the nipping. All the dogs were piled on top of each other. His dog isn't even a pit bull, and he owes this confused guy nothing. He is accused of nipping Nico. All parties, please raise your right hands. What you are about to witness is real. The litigants are not actors. They are involved in legitimate disputes, and they have agreed to have those disputes settled here in our forum, the People's Court. People's Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Marilyn Milian is now presiding. Litigants have been sworn, Your Honor. Thank you, Douglas. You're welcome, ma'am. All right, Mr. Calderon, you took your dog to a dog park in Tampa, correct? Yes, ma'am. What, what was the name of the dog park? It was, it's uh, Deputy Kotfola Kofol Memorial Dog Park, downtown Tampa. Okay. All right. And uh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a, a mixture of a Border Collie German Shepherd mix. Okay. So you bring your dog inside, and what happens while you're at the dog park? Um, he's, inter he's interacting with dogs, and uh, he's playing with uh, playing around and just sniffing, saying hello. And uh, he was sniffing the uh, defendant's dog, and that dog uh, quickly bit him right behind the ear, causing a big uh, uh, bleeding behind it. And I noticed it uh, right away, and uh, I went up to the owner, and I told him about it, and he, How he did felt you know sorry who the about owner that. Was? Because he was right next to him. And I noticed that. All right. So what was it exactly that you said to him? I said that his dog bit, uh, bit my dog, and he, uh, he noticed the cut over the uh, back of the ear, and he, you know, he felt sorry, and he offered to pay for the vet bill. Uh, that's what he told me. We exchanged information. I got his phone number, and I called him from the dog park right there to verify that was his number. So ah, right okay. after that, was I left the dog park. Yes. Okay. So I have a question for you. Did he notice that his dog had bit your dog or he wasn't looking and he didn't even notice it? Uh, he noticed there was a scuffle, um, you know, that his dog was aggressively uh, okay. trying to get my dog. Uh, I pulled my dog Were there any away. other dogs involved? Not there. There was no other fight. No, not in this None. case. There were no other dogs. Okay. All right. So you get his number and what happens? Do you text back and forth with him initially once you took your dog to the vet? By the way, your dog had to have a couple of stitches, correct? Yes, ma'am. And your dog's okay now, but the bill is $387.95, right? Yes, ma'am. All right. So um, when you initially tell him that, uh, how do you do it? By text? Uh, I called him from the, uh, from the vet facility and uh, he agreed to pay for the... Uh, the vet bill, and we were going to meet on the 4th of January on a Saturday back at that same park. Did you go back to that park to meet him? I did, ma'am. And did he show up? No. All right. Let me ask you, Mr. Houghton, what is it that happened? I started playing fetch with my dog at the dog park. And as I was playing fetch with my dog, I threw the ball. His dog came running along with several other dogs. And... They all started going for the ball, and one of them got aggressive. I can't specifically say which one. And they all started just barking at each other's faces. And it was just a big scuffle in that whole situation. Um, when I went to go grab my dog, 
I grabbed him by the collar and brought him back. I wasn't too clear or see anyone else. Like I saw everyone grab their dog. I didn't specifically look for his dog or him. I didn't notice him at the time. I didn't notice anything there. But as I brought my dog back to uh, the area uh, that I was playing with my dog, his dog came over maybe several moments later and started barking in my dog's face. And my, literally he just sat there like it was like crazy or whatever, like something happened. And he came over, grabbed his dog when he was barking in his face and walked away. He came back, stated to me, your dog nipped my dog. I'm like, um, I, I don't think so. I didn't see anything. Uh, what, what, let me see it. So I asked him to see the nip. I was like, okay, um, well, I mean, that's crazy. That sucks. You know, I felt bad about the situation. And I would ask him, how do you know it was my dog? And he was like, well, I saw your dog do it. And I was like, I saw my your dog come over here and bark in my dog's face, and then my dog did not bite your dog whatsoever. And then the scuffle, I didn't see my dog bite any dog in the scuffle either. It was a bunch of dogs. I'm not sure how you saw specifically my dog bite your dog. So okay. I gave him my was number. Was there a discussion about posted. some prior... Oh, hold on one second. Was there, a, Mr. Calderon, was there a specific discussion about a prior incident where there was a ruckus with a bunch of dogs at the dog park? Did that ever happen? No, ma'am. There was only two specific dogs, my dog and his dog. Okay. And is this the fellow who you talked to? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And the number you called was his number. Of course, you did give him your number. You admit that. And then uh, you, did you make a plan to meet with him at the dog park and then not show up and not call and not say anything and just let the guy show up and waste his time? Yes. I actually go to that park every Sunday. Every Sunday. Not between nine and eleven every Sunday. I have not okay. Did seen you make a plan since. to meet him on Saturday? Did you make a plan no, to meet him not. that Saturday and to pay him? Did you ever tell him you were going to pay him? No, I didn't. I never said why I was going to pay him. Why not? Because your dog. Because okay. So then, why did you give him your number? Because I felt bad for his dog. I told him keep me posted. I thought it was just like a friendly note. I actually shared my number with several other people that day. Animal control gets involved because, according to him, you left them standing there holding the bag that Saturday. So then you do call animal control, correct, Mr. Calderon? Yeah, I do, ma'am. All right. And then animal control gets a hold of you. And I've read the animal control reports, Mr. Houghton, where you tell them that you never go to that dog park. Tell me about that. Because you just told me that you were there every Sunday. When Animal Control called me, myself, I told them the specific dog park I go to. They told me a dog park. I said I did not. I don't, I don't know that dog park. I don't know the name of that dog What's park. What's the I dog park they told you? There. I don't remember. Well, let's look at the Animal Control report. They went by your house on January 15th, tried calling you, left voicemail messages, left a note on your door, and you didn't answer them. That's what they say. Is that true or false? I'd have to say that's false, because I definitely spoke with them. They say they spoke with you. They say that their first attempt to contact you was January 15th, which was completely ignored. Is that true or false? Um, January 15th, I didn't see or hear their contact in me in any way, shape, or form. What did he tell you his name was on that day, Mr. Calderon? Uh, Travis. Is that your name? Travis. Mr. Houghton? My name is Lyndon. Yeah. We, we know, but I'm asking you, did you ever tell him your name was Travis? No. I mean, I don't know that, you know, that would be an attempt to throw you off if they're giving you their phone number. When you say, I called it right there, I don't know that he knew you were going to do that. If he was trying to throw you off, he would have given you a fake phone number. Um, here we go. So now on January 24th, Mr. Houghton, here's what we have from Animal Control. On 124, I'm following up on a bite that occurred at Deputy Cotfilia Memorial Dog Park. And you said you have a dog park in Brandon and would have no reason to go to a park in downtown Tampa. Well, the park we're talking about is a park you go to in downtown Tampa every Sunday, right? Yes. Okay, why would the animal control officer say that you told him that you have a park in Brandon and you never go to the animal park in downtown Tampa? I'm not sure. Maybe they probably misheard my, what I stated, but I can't say that I said that because I, I know for a fact that I didn't say that. Why in your answer to the complaint do you say there was some confusion in the beginning? I'm sorry, what do you... 
What are you referring to? In your in answer the to the of... plaintiff's complaint, in your pl answer to the plaintiff's complaint, you say that there was some confusion in the beginning because your dog was identified as a pit bull and it's not a pit bull. Uh, what's a confusion, though? You know a guy says your dog bit his dog. What, why are you playing dumb with the officer and saying that, that well, you know, you weren't there and that didn't happen? How is that well, confusion? Because... How many times do you get accused of the dog? You know, you, it, it, this has to be like a momentous event that someone accuses your dog of causing $400 in vet bills. Right. And when they stated that to me, the confusion was because he called my dog a pit bull when they first called and stated your pit bull bit someone and so on and so forth. I think the conversation went, I can't fully recall it, but I said, I don't have a pit bull. They said, um, well, the, you're saying that it was a pit bull, this, that, and a third. I'm like, I don't have a pit bull. I have a catahoula. Then they said, all right, well, they're, they're saying that someone, your dog, whatever it is, bit that dog, this, that, and a third. I'm like, I don't. Recall my dog. Well, according to animal uh, control, you totally denied ever going to that park. And then they came back at you another week later and said that he had identified you from pictures. And that's when you said, Oh, yeah, I was there. But let's see, let's see. I don't want to paraphrase. You know, you still claim that you didn't remember the incident and we're not at the park. An officer now says twice he talked to you and you said that. So I. I think Officer Lewis was a female because a female contacted me twice. She, um, okay. Secondly, yeah, secondly, uh, when she spoke with me, she spoke with me about the incident. I, the incident in the dog park she stated, I did not go to. I let her know that wasn't the dog park. I misunderstood what she must have stated. I told her I didn't go to that dog did park. Did you misunderstand to... again on, on, okay, did you misunderstand again in February? Because in February, you still say that you don't go to the dog park. In February, she says she talks to you that second time, and you she say you don't remember the incident. Yourself. Wait, two things. You say you don't remember mm -hmm. the incident, and you've never been to that dog park. But we know that's false, because you just told me all about the incident under oath. You remember an incident. Right. See, you're not telling them, hey, my dog didn't bite that dog. You're telling them, I don't know, it wasn't me. That's what you're telling them. And it isn't until, let's see when you say... They don't let it go. I got to tell you, this is this is a what's what city? Hillsborough County, Tampa, and Florida. They're they're good because most of these agencies lose interest after a few times, and they were really tenacious about it. Let's see. Did you ever admit to animal control that the stuff you said to me today? Did you ever tell them, hey, a guy accuses my dog of having bit, but the dog? Did you ever say that to them? I told them that I believe several, uh, several contacts later, and I said, I mean, I think I remember a time. I believe I said something like that, but I told them as I same thing. I told you. I told them I don't. My dog didn't bite anyone. Okay, here's the thing, though. But I don't. I've got two different people saying two different things, right? So I've got to determine who's telling me the truth. I've got documented instances where animal control says that you were trying to shirk your responsibility by just telling them I never go to that park. It wasn't me. I don't know what you're talking about. And then all of a sudden, when they won't let it go, th according to you, you tell me, and I'm not seeing that animal control report, but you tell me that you finally told them, okay, yeah, that was me. According to you, they have the dog park wrong the six times that they've attempted to reach you on this and the two times that they've talked to you. I find that a little hard to believe, particularly when Officer Lewis writes in her report that you said I would never be at a park in downtown Tampa, which is exactly where the park you go to every Sunday is. That is so specific. It's not that she named the wrong name of a park, which incidentally is named for an officer. It's that you literally were telling them that you're never there. Then we find out that your defense here is, oh, you know, that's not true. There were a bunch of dogs. So I got to decide which of you is lying. Who do you think I'm going to pick? Who do you think I'm going to pick they don't... when I've got you literally trying to weasel out? You don't show up on the Saturday. I know it's you because he's got your phone number. You eventually admit to being in that park. You denied having been in that park. You tell me that it's their mistake because they told you the wrong park. She tells me specifically in her report that you claimed I would never be in a park in downtown Tampa. So who do you think, Douglas, what's this sounding like to you, sweetheart? It's not sounding good for the D. No. <laughs> no. Okay?
because this isn't a case of beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt like a criminal case. It's a civil case. The standard of proof is by a preponderance of the evidence. And based on the shady things that I am seeing between your dealings and with animal control and your dealings with him, where you make an appointment and you don't show up, I'm pretty ready to rule that you were just trying to skirt your responsibility. I'm ruling in favor of the plaintiff in the amount of the $387.95. Verdict for the plaintiff. Well, this is not a good day in court for Mr. Houghton, the defendant. Mr. Houghton, let me talk to you for a moment. What do you think about what the judge just had to say to you? Um, well, they only stated me the name of the dog park one time, and that was the first phone call. And, I mean, that, of course I'm going to continuously say no, I didn't go there because you only told me the name of the dog park one time, and you only stated it one time, and that's what I'm speaking of, not several times after they called. Anyway, bottom line, the judge just plain didn't believe you, you know, and you promised you were going to pay mm -hmm. the vet bills, but you didn't. So what do you think about that? I didn't promise that. Well, the plaintiff says you did, and the judge agreed, and you are going to have to pay the $387, and I'm sorry, but that's the judge's verdict. You're a loser here today, okay? Sorry about that, but okay. that's the way it is. All right, Mr. Calderon, you must be feeling pretty good right now, I would think. This has been a long time coming. Yes, sir. Um I'm pretty satisfied with the outcome. Are you going to go to that dog park again? You know, you've been there before. We, do you keep going back? Yes, sir. Well, congratulations, and that'll wrap up this case. <laughs> we've, we've been through it all. Let's find out more now about how the judges feel about this. Judge Millian and her husband, Judge John, and another session of After the Verdict. The claim in this case was only $387, not a huge vet bill, something that the plaintiff probably could have just stroked a check for if he wanted to, but he pursued it pretty doggedly, wouldn't you say? <laughs> yes, he did. So not always just about the money. No, right. And small claims is uh, most often not about the money, but about the principle. I think he felt very um, taken aback by the fact that the guy just left him standing there that Saturday after saying he would pay it. Now, certainly with the evidence in this case, there are certain things as a judge that you're looking for, just like in a poker game, you're looking at other players for a tell. When you have somebody giving a false name, potentially, when you have somebody making a prior inconsistent statement, and especially when you have police reports saying that the guy said, hey, I've never even been in that park before. I don't know where that dog park is. Right. Those are tells. Those are tells. And the thing is, I, 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 you know, the Travis thing doesn't bother me very much because he's sitting there giving him the correct phone number. So I don't know what was going on there. But I definitely see that he's attempting to minimize and, you know, uh, weasel his way out of the payment later because, you know, when he says to me, Oh, uh, she gave me the wrong name of the park. We know that's not true. Right. Because it was a very detailed explanation by the officer in, in the animal control report saying he said he would never go to a park in the downtown Tampa area. So it was very specific. Right. Why in the world would the officer say that and the report if, well, out to get somebody? It just doesn't yeah, make no, sense. Yeah, no, it just didn't make sense. Right. And, um, you know, oftentimes when you have a civil case, you're looking to see, all right, this, these are two diametrically opposed Absolutely. stories. Which one of them is not being forthright? And Wasn't a tough choice for you no, on the credibility exactly. question. No. Was it tough for you or? Not at all. No, I didn't think so. <laughs> I was recently a victim of Hurricane Laura and my house was ruined. Is there any legal way to get the insurance company to get me some money to live before they get around to surveying my damage? Well, it's all about the insurance policy. You have to read what your policy says. That is everything. But I will say this to you, if, 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 if the insurance company has an obligation to give you money to live while they survey the damage and they don't do it, Use the two magic words, bad faith. Call them up and say it. You will not believe how they will jump to if what they were doing was wrong. And that will do it for this case. Litigants are in the courtroom for the next case. These are the plaintiffs, Aaron May and Dawn Brewer. They say the defendant is their current landlord. And they're in a huge feud. And they're turning to this court for help in recovering the money owed to them. The defendant has stolen their electricity. The kitchen sink leaks. And they're tired of hearing drip, drip, drip all night. They're here seeking a rent rebate of $3,000. And are suing for just that today. This is the defendant, Lauren. 
She says yes, there was a very small leak in the kitchen sink, but it was fully functional while she worked on getting it repaired. These plaintiffs were nitpickers from the day they arrived, complaining the air filters in the units weren't thick enough. And even though air filters are the tenant's responsibility, she changed them out of her own expense. While nice gals finish last, because nothing she does makes the plaintiffs happy. Oh, them? No way. She's accused teeing off a tenant. The defendant has filed a countersuit for $8,000 for all she's out. All parties, please use your right hands. Welcome back to the People's Court. Next case on the docket. The plaintiff says help because her landlord is in a big feud with her. And the plaintiff says the landlord is stealing her stuff. But the defendant says the plaintiff is a real complainer and nothing makes her happy. It's the case of rotten roommates. Thank you, Douglas. You're welcome, ma'am. All right, Ms. May and Ms. Brewer, you had rented an apartment from the defendant uh, from when to when? From November 5th, 2019 to January 31st, 2020. Now, it was supposed to be a year-long lease, but um, all kinds of problems happened that we're about to talk about, and so that's why you ended up moving out in January. What was the problem that first surfaced that caused the bad blood? The first problem was the kitchen. We discovered that the kitchen had a huge leak in the wall, and the defendant had a leak expert or a leak detector come out and they told us that they had to rip out the entire kitchen wall and that we should not use the kitchen or use it as little as possible. So on that first problem, um, you know, stuff happens, leaks happen. So were they willing to fix it? Um, because She said she was gonna uh, have it my, fixed. But you guys didn't want it fixed during the holidays. You didn't want construction going on during the holidays, which is understandable, right? It was Christmas, yes. So yeah. um, the agreement was to have it fixed right after Christmas, but okay. nothing ever happened. Well, um, by then she was we, telling we you guys you needed to move out because other stuff happened. Correct. So Correct. You, fi you folks end up, who's who here, by the way? Who's May? I'm Erin. You're May okay. and you're Brewing. Oh, okay. I'm done. Okay, so now um, somehow you guys end up finding out that the washer and dryer, which is a common area, used by how many other tenants? There were three in the back and two next door. Is apparently on your electric bill. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, did you know that, Ms. Lauren, that, um, that it wasn't on its own separate meter? No, I didn't know that. I had purchased the unit in middle of November. So I didn't actually even um, lease them. It was the company that owned the unit before I did that had made a lease out to them. And I did not know that there was a, that, there, that it was on the same meter. Has that been fixed or not yet? It would be a few thousand dollars to fix and I was going to do it, but then the next, the next person that came in, we decided that she would get all the quarters from the, all the change from the um, wash, washing from the dryer and that I would get- Cause they're coin the operated. The washing okay. Machine. So no, it has not been fixed, but it's just- But you worked out a deal. Out. Yes. Okay. Exactly. All right. So you guys find that out and there's no, there was no deal worked out. You all of a sudden you find it out. Apparently you're the ones, Ms. May and Ms. Brewer who tell her about it. What was her reaction when Correct. you told Correct. her about it? But she originally said she was going to go down to the city and we were going to work things out. And then she tried, said that she was going to reimburse me $25 only when I did a little investigation with the city and because the electric bill was in my name. <clears throat> and I asked them to show me proof of like what was electric was being used before we turned it into our name when it was under their original real estate agent's name. And how much was that? So from the short period of time from October 28, 2019, to November 7th, 2019, the electric bill was 3140 just for the electric, not including the water. The total bill was 6953. This was accumulated when the apartment was empty with no tenants. That's why I was trying to work something out with her um, during that time to go to the city. We were going to try to figure something out. Um, but that never happened. So right. you're, you want to work it out. She wants to work it out, but you don't come to an agreement. So what do you end up doing? Originally, this argument started over trying to add my sister to the lease. Um, oh. I did tell her that I would shut the breaker off because I'm paying the electric. Uh, but I never did shut the breaker off because the breaker was in my kitchen. Well, did you also tell that to the other tenants? No, ma'am. 
Ms. Lauren, you have a series of texts between you and the other tenants where they try to use the washer and dryer, and what did they say? They said that they were not being allowed to use it and that these two women had blocked the, uh, had blocked the washing machine and dryer. And then they also said that they had tried to charge rent or they had tried to charge to use the washing machine and dryer and they had taped over those little uh the quarter where you put the quarters in and they had taped that and um they basically they also told the other tenant that they could shut off the uh the power in, in the other tenant's kitchen if they wanted to but they weren't going to do that okay now how did they um you i can't remember the phrase you used but how did you say they blocked it off how what did they do uh they well, I was told by the other tenant that they taped the uh, the quarters and that they literally physically uh, would not let her because- Tape the slots, not stuff. the quarters. They tape the slots where the quarters the enter. Slots. All That's right. It. Whose idea is it for you guys to move out? Is it your idea or her idea or what happened? It was the defendant's idea. So things got a little nasty between you guys, didn't they? Because I've read the texts back and forth. You call her yes, an idiot. You tell her she's stupid. Um, you're telling the other tenants that you could if you wanted to, but you won't, but I could turn off your breakers. Uh, you, you tape the coin slots and, um, and don't let other people use it. I mean, I understand your frustration. Why should you have to pay it? They're right. You have no business having a rental place that has their, uh, the communal washer dryer. You need to spend the dough and separate the meter. You've got to do it. If you don't feel like doing it, then you do what you did, which is you have to come up with an agreement, but the other side has to agree with you. So, you know, what we have here is a problem where I see your side, but I see their side too. I don't see how you handled it because you don't get to deprive other tenants of using the washer and dryer. That was crazy. Um, you know, what your right is to do is withhold some rent to compensate for it. That's what any other tenant would have done. They would have just let the other tenants use it, and then the next time when their rent was due, pay less or something. So now let's talk about what you're suing for. You're suing for December, and you're suing for the security deposit, correct? Yes, ma'am. You lived there in January, but did you pay rent, or is that your last month's rent that you had paid that in advance? Last the month. last month's that was a lot. Oh, okay. Rent. Is that accurate? All right. Everybody's on the same page. I got it. All right. So, but you feel that you should be recompensed for December rent. I don't know why you picked December and not January, but anyway, recompensed for December rent, just December, because of the leak. Um, it, 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 because it, it, according it, it, to you, it was uninhabitable, it, right? except for that the idea of not fixing the leak was yours because it was Christmas. So well, I'm, I'm not sure how she would owe you that. Allow me to explain that. Um, the last month would have been November of next year, which is what she refunded. And January was the last month that we actually stayed in the apartment. And that was when we went almost half a month with no hot water and one unworking toilet and a broken kitchen. Well, now, so according to you, when they send you a text saying we don't have hot water, you send a plumber over there, correct, Ms. Lauren? Yes, I did. I and the plumber says there's nothing water. wrong with the hot water. Aaron was there, and we all went in, and he turned on the faucet in the kitchen. He ran it for a while. Then we went to the first. There was hot water. Then he ran it to the bathroom. There was hot water. Then he ran it to the other bathroom, and there was hot water. And then they kept texting, oh, we don't have hot water. But she was there. She so you think, the they were setting up, you think they were setting up a lawsuit is what you think, yes, because I by do. then I think that you had already told them about... you're out. You had already, so when did you hire a lawyer to file a, a notice of eviction or a seven day to cure or whatever it is that you ended up filing? I served them the cease and desist, I believe on the third. Of what, January? January? All right. Ms. Lauren, are you a new landlord? Like, is this the first building yes, you've owned? Yes, it's the first time I've owned a property, yes. Okay, um, there was a $1,500 deposit. There's no dispute about that, right? Yes. Okay, and you did not return the $1,500, why? Well, uh, because I had to pay for my lawyer to write up that I also had paid my lawyer to write something else up for them. And then also I had cleaning, there were cleaning charges to do. Also, I had to get my, my lawyer to respond to some uh, bogus complaint that they had filed with the Department of Agriculture and, Agriculture. Uh, and something Which else. happens to monitor the rentals. But here's the thing, okay? The court has asked you to submit any proof you have of the amount that you're asking for, 
You have picked the figure six hundred dollars in legal fees. I see where for a full eviction he was going to charge. He is it a he or she? It's a it's a guy. It's okay, a he. where he was going to charge you fifteen hundred for the full eviction, but. All he ended up doing was one letter, which is on a form. What did he charge you for that? Or how did he break it down? Or he didn't break it down? Because at that point, you were frustrated. And I think your exact answer was, my time costs money to be chasing all this information. That's fine, but that's your counterclaim. And if you don't take the time to figure out what he is actually going to charge you for that one letter and prove to me that you paid it, you are, how are you going to prove to me that $600 is the amount that you're entitled to? How are you doing that? Uh, during that time, I texted him and I called him. And every time I text and call him, he charges time because he's a lawyer. Um, and right, uh, you know how those lawyers are, by golly. Anyway, you might need to get another lawyer. All right, but um, I'm just telling you, you need to educate yourself on what Florida statutes say. There's just one statute with a lot of parts. If in fact you can prove to me that they left damages behind, that they left the place filthy, that you had to do X, Y, Z because of them. All right, then you can keep for those damages. But let's talk about what your counterclaim is against them. Your counterclaim, according to you, is eight thousand something dollars. You want the three thousand dollars for the break a lease penalty, but you're the one who told them you gotta go. Well, I did right? actually. Okay, uh... that's a rhetorical question. The professional cleaning of a hundred dollars, <laughs> according to you, they left the place a shambles. Do you have any pictures that show that it was so dirty it had to be professionally cleaned? I know that you did professionally clean it for the new tenant, but yeah. Oh, I know that you did. You have a statement from who? The tenant. It's a statement about how dirty the place was, and I also had right. The but I got. See, she they have an obligation. A, a a tenant has an obligation to leave it in broom swept condition. I see the pictures that they offered. As a landlord, anytime any tenant leaves, you need to take your telephone out of your uh, out of your pocket and take pictures and video of anything that's a complaint, because you're going to have to prove to a court of law that they left it in a in a subpar fashion. But you have zero pictures, so that's a problem. You're also suing for harassment, a thousand dollars for the tampering with the electric box, and even though you're suing for three thousand for breaking the lease. Penalty. You got another two thousand for breach of contract. It sounds to me like these women made you crazy. They reported me to two different agencies for false claims about the hot water. I've never had any problems with the hot water. The tenant, nobody. There have been no problems with the hot water. No one has said anything about the hot water, and I have not got the hot water fixed. That was just something they came up with because they felt like it. Then they reported me to the agricultural department. Then they also reported me to the Lake Worth department. And I asked how, how I had gotten this citation. And the, the man from Lake Worth uh, told me that they had reported me saying that, um, that I had been threatening to turn off the electric, which is exactly what these two women had been doing. Yes, I had you that. You report in her for and, threatening to turn no, off the electric? No. no. And it's an email. He put it in writing that you guys had claimed that I was threatening to turn off the electricity. Give me a moment. That is exactly what the inspector says. That wow. Yes. Uh, that whoever that filed the complaint fi filed it saying that you claimed that the landlord was attempting to turn the power off. I guess I got it. I, I'm confused. I guess. Um, mm. I, I... So what do we have? We have you asking for $1,500, all of your rent back for December because it was inconvenient for you to live in a place with a leak. The only reason that the repair didn't take place at that moment is because, understandably, you didn't want construction going on during the holidays. You're not going to get December rent back. Regarding the security deposit, I see the nastiness, and I know that it made you nuts and stuff, but, and I see that they're filing complaints, but that's their right. If the complaint isn't well-founded, then too bad. So let's talk about what in your counterclaim is a reason to keep a security deposit. Let's go through the things you are saying. You should get some legal fees, but not the amount that you made up out of whole cloth, because it's just one letter. You don't have any pictures to prove that they left the place messy. I have an email. And in fact, their pictures account. show the opposite. I don't care. I want proof, okay. not somebody else says it was really dirty. That's not proof. And you have a lot to learn about being a landlord. Unfortunately, yes. this really was trial under fire, because they were really bad tenants to you. They were mad. Yes. And they reacted very, very poorly. And th this is pretty much the nightmare tenant for a landlord, 
because they felt you were treating them poorly, so they then took out cannons and shot cannons at you because you threw a spitball at them. It is very obvious to me that you guys have been down this road before and you know what you're doing. On the other hand, what you don't know about being a landlord could fill a library. And you need to educate yourself. And unfortunately for you, you mess with the wrong people because these people bring a gun to a knife fight, okay? So that's what ended up happening. But that doesn't mean you get to keep their security deposit. And that doesn't mean you get to get rent back just because you didn't feel like having that. You guys are out of your minds. This isn't the way it works. As for getting December back, absolutely not for the reasons I've explained. As for your getting your security deposit back, the only thing that I am going to allow you to keep, because I do think that you went through a lot and you ended up having to hire a lawyer because of things that were happening that I don't agree with, all right, is I'm going to allow you to keep 250 of it and I'm gonna order you to pay the plaintiffs the remainder of their security deposit back, $1,250 net judgment in favor of the plaintiff. Well, what a case. The plaintiffs are going to get only $1,250 back, not the $3,000 they wanted. Let's find out how she feels about this. Lauren, let me ask you, uh, this has really been a trial under fire for you. What's your reaction to what just happened? I think only some of the evidence was presented, and I think it was pretty ridiculous. Um, but that's okay. Uh, everything's fine, and we move on. Okay. Well, you've learned a lot from this. No question about that. The, uh, the plaintiffs, let's talk to them now, Ms. May, Ms. Brewer. You didn't get what you were seeking, but boy, the judge says you 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 fight a knife fight with guns. You you you're tough ladies. You know we, we you may have a lot of things to learn as being a tenant. You know, but uh, she's not our first slumlord. This is true. Well, the judge said you've done this before. She kind of felt that way. Is that right? Indeed. Welcome Indeed. to Lake Worth. Holy mackerel. Okay, well, that's it. I hope you're satisfied. 1250 you get not 3000 And that'll wrap it up for this really intriguing case. A lot to learn about, about renting. Let's find out now and join the, uh, the judges for another session of After the Verdict. Here is Judge Millian and her husband, John, who is in real life, also a judge. Here they are. You had a confrontation here between some kind of, it was a lot of, it was pretty abrasive, the relationship. And I have to say, you've got a new landlord here, but Honestly, I think These if are not they were tenants. my tenants, they, they are were, not they've new been around tenants. the block. They have been around and the block. If, yeah, yeah. And it was, it was, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of time to go into it um, in the middle of the trial, but it, you know, there were inches and inches of text. Right. And, and a email. new landlord doesn't realize just how sacrosanct a security deposit is. I mean, the rules are very narrow. Very strict. For... And here's the thing: anybody within the sound of my voice who is either a landlord or a tenant, anywhere, find out what the law is in your state. There's a beginning, middle, and end. It'll be, right. you know, 20 pages, 30 pages, whatever right. it is. Print it out, read it, make right. it your, your, your business to read it because right. you should know your rights as a tenant and Absolutely. you should know your rights as a, your obligations as a right. landlord. And once you get, once you go through it one time, it's not that complicated. You don't have to go to MIT. No, and, to it, and now, it the, it, you know, it's not, you know, they don't have to go to a library. They can go to the internet. That's all right. right. And it's all digested <laughs> for you by all the law firms who want your business, right. you know? Right. Absolutely. Right. So we got this question from Joseph from Philly. How does a homeowner need to secure firearms before taking in renters? There are no specific laws about this, but common sense should dictate that if you have firearms, you got to put them in a case and you got to lock the case, especially if you're renting to people with children. That is just a must because everything is going to be determined by whether you committed negligence. And the safest thing always is to lock the firearms up to make sure renters can't get to them.